All right. Uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Rob Clark. Uh, it's December 4th, 2023. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield University in McMinnville. And Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Uh, Happy first, to be here. First question is why wine? Well, I like to drink wine. That's where it started out. And uh, as time went on, uh, we experienced you know, better wines. You can afford a little bit better wines. Uh, you learn a little bit more about it. But my first, uh, and it happened to be a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, eye-opening experience is we were at Morton's Bistro back in 19, I think it was 94 and 95. And uh, we asked the waiter there what he'd recommend. And he recommended this Yves Chimwood 1993 Cuvée J. And uh, we had it. and it, kind of woke us up. It was like, wow, what a cool wine. So that started our path down uh, Oregon, Willamette Valley Pinot Noirs in particular. And um, that continued on, and I probably would have just stayed on that track uh, until I was, I was not in the wine industry at the time. I, it was a career change, kind of fortuitous. Um, in 99, I worked for a company out in Dallas, Oregon, and they decided to close the plant. So I had to look for another, I was an engineer at the time, uh, an engineering job. And I looked for a few places in Salem and I'd really, we'd moved down to, from uh, Seattle uh, about five years previously and I thought I was gonna have to move back to Seattle. And this is one of those really strange things in life. In the Statesman Journal in May of that year of 99, there was an article about uh, Chemeketa Community College starting up their viticulture and enology program. And I read the article and I thought, God, if I ever did something different, it would really be fun to work in a vineyard. And not knowing at the time that that was ever on the plate, um, and it tucked in the back of my mind. They closed the plant in July. I started looking for jobs. And then uh, when I realized I couldn't get the type of job, engineering job that I, uh, that I knew, um, I uh, approached my wife and said, hey, they're starting up this viticulture program at Chemeketa. What do you think? And I was 42 at the time. And she said, well, if you're going to make a career change, do it while you're in your 40s. Don't wait till you're 50. And so I, with a tentative foot, I went and talked to the uh, would-be instructor, who was Al McDonald at the time, and uh, at, at the main campus, and uh, started asking some questions about it. And it sounded like it was worthwhile getting into. And he asked me, uh, um, why viticulture? And I said, well, I've been sitting behind a desk for 18 years and I'd really like to maybe get outside, do something a little different. And it was kind of funny. His comment was, well, I've been in the vineyard for more than 20 years and I wouldn't mind sitting behind a desk. <laughs> and I, I appreciated that. And uh, anyway, I started taking classes and the more classes and the more people I met, I was pretty hooked after like the first quarter that yeah, I want to continue, uh, get a two year degree in viticulture. And um, that's what I ended up doing. Amazing. So we'll come back and pick that up in a second. Let's talk about life before wine a little bit. Tell us about where you were born and raised and kind of the path that brought you to Oregon. Well, we moved a lot, a lot around the country. My father was in the Air Force and uh, we lived in, um, well, we lived overseas, we lived in actually Africa. That's where I was born in Tripoli, but I was only six months old. Don't remember any of it, just pictures that my parents showed me. And then we moved around to various places, Montana, New York, uh, Tacoma. And when I was about nine, maybe 10, uh, my dad uh, retired from the Air Force and we moved out to California. So I grew up, I went to a little bit of grade school there, all junior high, high school and, and college. I got a degree in mechanical engineering, graduated in 81 from UC Berkeley and then moved up to Seattle because I wanted to get out of the Bay Area and fell in love with Seattle. And so I started working as an engineer there and did that for about 18 years, um, 12 of it in Seattle and then six of it down in uh, Oregon, in Salem. We moved to Salem in 94. And um, yeah, so they, until they closed the plant. So I was a mechanical engineer for 18 years and then they, uh, they were going to close the plant and I didn't want to move back east and I didn't um, I didn't want to continue. We wanted to stay in Salem mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, that's when I went to the, the school, Chemeketa, and did that program. And I've never looked back since. Tell me about mechanical engineering. What, how did that become your path? I guess I had this mechanical aptitude. 
And you know, when you're in high school, you're skipping around a lot. And I said, well, you know, what do I know? I don't really, well, I'm, I'm mechanically oriented. So I decided to leave mechanical engineering. And, uh, and it was good. I, I enjoyed it. It was a good career. I wasn't totally in love with it, but I liked it. And I would have kept doing it. If they hadn't closed down the plant, it was a lot of security there. And I did like the work. Um, like I say, it wasn't a, a burning passion or anything, but they, they made it comfortable. And I was good at it. And, so, yeah. And what about your time in college? Tell us a little bit about uh, time at Berkeley. Um, well, it was a lot of studying, of course, but we did manage to have fun. Probably had more fun than I should have. <laughs> My grades might reflect some of that. Um, I ran track when I was at UC Berkeley, so that was fun. That was a great diversion. And uh, I was there for four years. I, I actually went to a junior college for one year after high school and then uh, spent four years at Berkeley getting a degree in mechanical engineering, and then left shortly after graduating uh, for Seattle. I just felt like I wanted to get out of the Bay Area. And uh, I had family up in Seattle, cousins, and so I knew it a little bit, and I really liked Seattle when I came here. And I started working there, and that's when I decided to make my home. I met my wife about two years after, my wife-to-be, and uh, so we married in uh, 84. And we're still married here, coming up on 40 years, so. Congratulations in advance. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and she has supported this whole thing. And in fact, we realized that getting into the wine industry, it was just, it, 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 was, it was a nice life move. Um, I am passionate about uh, grape growing and winemaking, and it's been fun. And I have since, in, uh, two, at the end of 2020, um, I got out of the vineyard management business. I had my own vineyard management company. And uh, I sold it to uh, my foreman, who was with me for 20 of those 21 years. And it's just worked out great. He's continued. We still stay in touch. And in fact, I go and work for him sometimes now. <laughs> and it's nice just to collect a paycheck, not have to worry about the day in and day out of running a business, managing vineyards. So you mentioned that you're, you, had, you had an interest in wine uh, and, and the Chemeketa thing sort of just sort of was fortuitous timing. So tell me about taking the step from interested consumer of wine to something more than that. What was the first term or first couple of terms that Chemeketa like and what, what drew you in about wanting to continue down that path? Uh, I like the fact of, I guess, being out outside um, working with the grape vines. Um, it seemed like a, it just fit, like a, it, was a, it was a peaceful thing to do. Um, I really liked the people I met. I just met all kinds of, not only students, but we got to go on field trips, meet other growers, meet winemakers. Um, part of the, one of the really great experiences was the uh, cooperative work experience. I had somebody take me under their wing and I helped him. He was leasing a vineyard and I'd helped him. Uh, managing the vine. So I got a real taste of what it was like to actually manage a vineyard. The classes were great. They were very practical. Um, it was a great first, even second or third step. I know how to prune a vine and, and, and raise them up and what it takes to get healthy grapes and go through harvest. So that was good. But actually doing it in the vineyard, um, that even, so that was between my first and second year, uh, the cooperative work experience, and I spent the summer helping this guy with his vineyard, and it, it, it just enforced what I wanted to do. And then, as it happened, uh, how I started my own vineyard management company is uh, I, somebody approached me who'd heard I was helping this guy, and they had two acres, and he said, listen, I'm, I'm retired, and I want to enjoy my retirement, and I'd really like someone to come in and manage the vineyard. And I said, okay, I don't have much experience. And he said, that's fine, we'll work through it together. And I, I did, I started with those two acres, uh, finished up my second year, and then there was a demand, quite a demand for vineyard managers, for people to manage vineyards. And, and we specialized in smaller vineyards. You know, that's how we started out. I think the next vineyard we took over was uh, uh, seven acres. Um, and as it turned out, too, is that the school uh, was just planting their vineyard. So they planted their vineyard in, I believe, in 2001. Um, we were still taking classes at the main campus. In fact, I finished up at the main campus in 2001. Uh, during that time, they'd cleared the land, built the tractor barn up there. Um, 
and started planting a vineyard. So they needed a vineyard manager, and, and it was great. Al McDonald said, listen, you've got a vineyard management company. You've been through the uh, program. Would you like to manage our vineyard? So started out with the one and a half acres there, and we expanded it to two and a half, and it kept adding until it's, it's about eight acres now. And I managed that up through 2020, so in about 2001 to 2020, I managed the Chemeketa Vineyard. Let's start with that then. We'll talk about the vineyard first. So taking a vineyard from that, from basically nothing and, and managing it for that long, tell me about the process for yourself and what were the biggest sort of hurdles? What were the biggest learning opportunities for you on, in that process? Uh, applying what we learned in class to actual practical situation. Um, Al McDonald was a great mentor. I would, could go back and ask him questions because you get out there and you start working through and there's like, well, it depends. You know, what's, 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 how is this working? Is this, why, why is this is different? And uh, he was a nice resource to have uh, to be able to go back and um, just learn some of the in intricacies. Um, the other big one, which the program uh, prepared me really well for, was the challenge of running a business. There's a lot of regulations. Uh, from employees and uh, payroll and my responsibility to them, my responsibility for their safety. So that was a, a lot of learning on the fly, um, getting in touch with the right people to make sure I was doing things how I was supposed to be doing, you know, f for, for human, I guess, decency, <laughs> treating them how they should be treated, as well as the regulatory issues, and making sure that you know, payroll taxes were being paid and all that. So it was just, that was, there was a lot. That first three or four years, and I learned for many years after, but the first three or four years, it was a real ramp up, making sure you got the right insurance, and uh, just, just it, the, the list goes on. Um, the biggest challenges were, uh, I suppose, um, managing each vineyard because there, you know, there's basic things you do to all vines, but every vineyard's a little bit different, so we, we have to sort some of that out. And then uh, how much to grow the company. We kept picking up uh, you know, five acres here, 10 acres there. Um, our big jump was uh, somebody approached us about managing 30 acres, and we said, well, I think it's time to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we grew the company to about 150 acres at, at its max, um, and that was pretty much what, the way we were set up, what we could run, had about fi up to 15 employees, more for harvest, had a foreman. And then uh, it became the time to, well, do we keep growing? Because there was demand. I could have I doubled the size of the company. There was that kind of demand out there. But um, part of the story I haven't told is I also got into the winemaking part of it. And what I didn't want to do is uh, when you grow uh, when you're in a certain level, when you grow a company, you can't just, um, in this example, like 150 acres, was we were pretty maxed out with the, the resources we had. So it was like, okay, hire another foreman, more crew. Well, you just don't expand like 15 acres or 20 acres more. You, you have to pretty much double your size or at least you know, go up 100, another 100 acres. And that was more than I wanted to do. So I, I capped it off at about 150 acres because at the time, it's almost from the beginning, I started getting into winemaking. And that was never a, a goal. That was never a thought. But going back to that cooperative work experience, um, this guy said, well, you should really see what happens to the grapes after you grow them. So he uh, recommended, he was buying about, I don't know, three and a half tons of Pinot Gris. He says, I'll tell you what, we'll split all the costs, we'll go through and we'll make this wine together. And we did it, and it was really fun. And we each made about, we made about 200 cases total. So he got 100 cases, I got 100 cases. And my thought was, well, if I can't um, sell the wine, then me and my friends are going to have a lot of wine to drink. But you know, you learn, as you go through the whole process, you start learning, you know, I have to get a label design, I have to get a, the TTB permit, an OLCC permit. Um, and then I had connections with uh, um, people in the wine industry, a wine shop owner. Um, I met somebody who was self-distributing uh, small, small people, so he helped me sell the wine. And it was so successful, we sold out um, well before the next season, so it's like, okay, I want to do it again. Mm -hmm. And then we went from 97 cases to about 350 cases and uh, learned a little bit more about the business, um, getting distributors. My, my business model, I never had a tasting room. Um, I did do a little bit of wholesale 
uh, wine sales myself, but that's very time consuming and you got to beat a lot of pavement. And so I decided that's not the model we're going. So I started seeking out distributors. And one of the, uh, going back, the um, great collaboration projects that you run across is um, Lowell Ford was another person I really looked up to in the industry. And uh, he had been growing some uh, grapes on his property. They hadn't even started their big project out in uh, uh, um, Dallas, Illahi. But, um, and he said, well, I got these Pinot Gris grapes and um, I'd like to, I don't have a buyer for them. The, the, what I've been doing hasn't been working out. So I said, told him, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I will make the wine. If you supply the grapes, we'll split all the costs, that, you know, what you spent doing the grapes and all the bottling costs and the winery fees and all that. And uh, uh, we'll see if this works out. So we did it. And I think we, like I said, we got 350 cases. And I'd gotten a second distributor by then and the wine sold. So we, we were collaborating that way for about six years or so. And then he started Ilahi, him and his son, his family, I should say. And uh, I, I lost that. But, but by then I was rolling. And I, most of the grapes th that I used for my wine were from vineyards that I managed. In fact, all the grapes I used were from vineyards that I would manage. So Terrapin Cellars is my wine label. And what I ended up doing, that's a separate company, is I'd go to the owners who were managing their vineyard and you know, they pay me to manage their vineyard. And as a separate side deal from Terrapin Cellars, I'd say, well, I'd like to buy this block of grapes or this many tons of grapes. So for me, it was the best of both worlds. I, I didn't own any vineyard land. I don't own a winery, but I was able to grow my own grapes. So I knew exactly what was going to the product and, and um, purchase those grapes from those vineyards and then um, take, take them away and, and go ahead and make the wine. You mentioned the demand for people to do what you were doing, to, to manage vineyards, especially small vineyards at that time. Tell me about initial impressions for you as you started to meet the growers and, and see the vineyards. Um, what were your impressions of the people and the grapes? And how did you, what did you sort of see your role as, as a vineyard manager in that, in that regard? Uh, well, I knew I was responsible for getting those grapes from pruning, which probably most people are doing now, or starting to think about doing, all the way through harvest. So it was pretty clear cut. And there were some people that were very knowledgeable about their vineyards, the whole process. Um, I had a lot more input from them. It's always, you know, you listen to the customer. Um, and then they had other people that pretty much were hands off. They just said, I want grapes at the end of the time. Uh, most of the time we were not responsible for selling those grapes. They would find a buyer and sometimes I would work with the buyer. They would have certain demands. They'd want to come out and look at the vineyard and the, you know, maybe fruit thin it or uh, maybe, um, I won't say grow things this way. I guess it was more about fruit quality. Hey, can, can we do this to improve the fruit quality? Or they just you know, sometimes put eyes on it. Um, so it was working with the end buyers as well as my customer, uh, the vineyard owner. And like I say, the, some of the vineyard owners were very hands-on. And a, most, a lot of them, I would say the majority were just, please give me some good grapes so that I can sell at the end of this time. And the nice thing for me, and, and over time we did find some buyers for fruit, but it was nice not to have that responsibility. We went into it and says, well, I'm not going to find you a buyer for your fruit, but we will give you a product, a sellable product at the end. And uh, I really enjoyed it, all the different aspects. I even had some owners who wanted to do their own tractor work. So, because most of the vineyards we would do everything. We'd come in, like I say, from pruning, to shoot thinning, to spraying, to um, trellis work, to sometimes we planted whole blocks of vineyards. Anything that was involved in the vineyard, that, that's what we were to do. But there were some owners that, like I say, would want to perhaps maybe drive the tractors, and so they would do that part of it. Um, maybe they'd like to be involved, maybe it's to save a few bucks. Tell me about your sort of initial we'll say vineyard philosophy or, or farming philosophy as you were starting, starting into the business, how were you approaching the farming and how were you approaching sort of the vineyard and did that change as your, as your business grew? Uh, well, we got, definitely got more knowledgeable and especially the more time you spend in a particular vineyard, you know, uh, the very vigorous areas, so you manage those a little bit different, you know the areas that aren't quite as vigorous. Um, I definitely went to seminars, learned a little bit about nutrition, uh, learned a little bit about um, soil health. Um, one of the, the big 
things I really enjoyed doing is early on, uh, and Chemeketa drove this point home, or, or encouraged us anyway, is to participate in the live program. And that's the low uh, input viticulture and analogy. And so from the very beginning, that's the way we went ahead and managed those vineyards sustainable. And we got a lot of our vineyards um, certified sustainable. It's a process, application, paying fees, and, and, and um, following the live guidelines. And then I had other clients who didn't want to go through that process. They didn't want to go the extra expense of, of mainly, mainly registering, but one of the famous lines was, well, but manage my vineyard sustainable. I don't want to be part of the program, but because there was, there was expense on their part as far as fees, as far as uh, paperwork that we fill out. And uh, they didn't want to do that. But I would say that, yeah, in fact, if, for certain, we managed all our vineyards, at least as far as um, spraying, herbicides, and um, the fungicides, and everything necessary to get healthy grapes, um, fertilization, all with, uh, in the live guidelines. So I would say that all the acreage we ever did was, was managed sustainable. And all those vineyards could have been uh, managed sustainably, or I should say certified. It's just that some owners chose not to do that. I would probably say like two thirds to three quarters of the vineyards were certified sustainable. Mm -hmm. You talked earlier about how sort of you had sort of baseline for every vineyard, but that each vineyard needed some sort of special some special understanding or some. Uh, so tell me about getting to know a vineyard in that way, especially when you're managing that many vineyards at a time, uh, starting to understand what you had to do in, in which vineyard and, and kind of keeping that all straight, making sure each vineyard got what it needed. Yeah, they're, 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 they're definitely individual. Some of the vineyards we came to, they're already in great shape. Who'd ever been managing them before, whether it be the owner or whether it be another vineyard person, the company. Um, so those vineyards were the, the best to go into because they were in good shape already. There were some vineyards that were um, managed minimally. There was problems. So we had to go and fix those problems to, you know, there was a standard that we learned in school and what you see in other vineyards. There was a certain standard that you wanted to work to. And we were always about quality. Uh, you know, which is a fine line. You can spend a ton of time um, nursing each vine, or you, it, it, and there, there's a minimum, or you can go through a little bit quicker because it's also an economical thing too. You're trying to deliver a product at the end that your customer can sell. If it's going to, you know, thousands of dollars more than the uh, per ton than the than the industry standard, or the average price, for example, for Pinot Noir, if you're, yeah, I wouldn't say thousands, but hundreds of dollars more per ton, it's going to be harder for them to market those that fruit. Um, and there were some vineyards that were uh, that demanded or got more money because of their location, how they were taken care of. You know, it was a, a great ABA, for example, if it was. Uh, that then we were able to go in and spend a little bit more time, be a little more meticulous with that fruit um, and the vines and nutrition. We always tried to, we always grew healthy vines. If there was a problem, every, every vineyard we, we tested for uh, nutrition, um, what might in the soil, what was in the plant, and uh, we tried to uh, amend the, do what we needed to do to, uh, to get those plants to a healthy spot. So that was always produce, having healthy plants to produce healthy fruit. Then it comes down to um, how much maybe leaf pulling you want to do, how much fruit thinning do you want to do. Um, that would up the, up the uh, quality of the fruit. And, and there's some vineyards that are going to produce good fruit, maybe never great fruit. And there was some vineyards that were poised to produce really great fruit, their location, their aspect. Did you find in the time you were doing this that um, owners' expectations or demands changed in any way of your clients? Did you, were they asking more different things of you uh, before, uh, near the end of kind of your time running that company versus the beginning? I wouldn't say more, but there were some different changes they might want to make. They might want to see um, a little more time spent, maybe a little more time, for example, than one of the tiny things is shoot thinning. You know, some people tell you, or uh, I should say shoot positioning, um, a little more time to make the vineyard look uh, real pretty. 
Um, whether that made better fruit, I'm not sure. Um, maybe a little bit more time hedging, because it, when you hedge a vineyard multiple times, it does look good. It, it, you know, some people kind of view it as almost as a garden. Um, other people were just more practical. It's like, do your job, but you know, we're, we're watching the bottom line. And so that came up, and it, over the years, I guess it's like, it's probably going on now, it probably goes on in cycles. It's, it's like, you know, we're, 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 we can't get any more money for the fruit, so we need to try and stay at this baseline here. And so there was, that, that, there was, that was always a challenge. And labor uh, in the early days um, wasn't that much of an issue. I'd say the last four or five years when I was doing it, you know, late, mid to late teens, um, labor became a real issue in the vineyard. It was hard getting and keeping vineyard labor. I had a great crew, a great core crew. Um, some of the people with me for 20 years, and, and that was fabulous. A lot of people kind of came in and out. A lot of competition for labor like there is now, um, whether it be other crops or whether it be, you know, firefighting has been huge the last six, seven years. Um, it's tough. You're going through vineyards the busiest time of year in June. Plants are going like crazy. You get done with one vineyard, you go to the next vineyard, and then you're having to return, make the whole circle. And um, as, as the wildfires came on, that probably was the biggest for several years, the biggest problem because those guys could make so much more money, guys and gals, going out and working on the, uh, and the fire crews. So here we have you know, 12, 14 people working in the vineyard, and then the next day there's eight people. So we scrambled to you know, get more people or having the guys work longer hours if, if they wanted to. There's a lot of seven day work weeks in there, which people like and don't like. It's, it's more money, but <laughs> it's also exhausting. So let's talk about the, the wine side. As you mentioned, you had, you had no intentions of making wine at the beginning. So uh, tell me about your first winemaking experience and what made you want to keep doing it. Uh, well, I'll tell you why I wanted to keep doing it, because it was fun to be able to make something that you enjoyed drinking. <laughs> and that's the way that first Pinot Gris was. It was like, oh, this is good. And then, you know, I guess the best proof is people purchase it. They spend their money on it. And so that's, that was definitely a motivator to keep going. Like if it had just been received lackluster and, you know, it was a kind of a hassle to sell, I would have said, that's fine. I, this is what, what, I wasn't in this for it. To, to, to do it, to, to make a living off it. I was more into the vineyard management. But um, so this guy I told you about, he was making his wine at another winery. And so that's where we went the first year. And I made my wine uh, there with him, went through the whole process. About a year later, we bottled the Pinot Gris. And um, this winery was pretty crowded. The guy was great, the owner was great, but it was small, it was difficult to, to work uh, there with, with all of his stuff going on. So that f next year, which would have been 2002, I um, approached Eola Hills Wine Cellars, and I am still making my wine there today, and they had the room to take me in as a, as a um, started out as a custom crush client. I just had a wholesaler's license, and then what I wanted to do was get my own winery license, so I applied to the OLCC and the TTB to get a winery license. So I have a Terrapin Cellars is a bonded winery, alter, they call them alternating premises. So I don't own my, uh, any of the, I don't own the winery. Um, I use their employees, I pay them a fee. I have my own barrels, my own tank to make my wine there. I bring in my own fruit and do all my own packaging. But I get to bring in the grapes there, take them all through the process, bottle it there, and then I take it out of there and sell it someplace else. I do not sell my wine through Eola Hills. Um, I have distributors for that. And probably at our height, we were in six different states. So we had five distributors. And so that process, so that was, it, it, was, it was a great, um, uh, it's just a great idea, this, uh, these alternating premises wineries, because I had, we didn't have the money to purchase a winery and purchase all the equipment. So, um, and they're gonna make wine anyway. So we help their bottom line because they're gonna be there, their employees are gonna be there. Um, I pay them a fee. I have a product at the end. I take it to distributors and, and they're my partners in the wine sales business. And we distribute our wine out of Washington and Oregon and Maryland, Virginia, Delaware. We were in Virginia or in South Carolina for a while, but that didn't last. And that's probably our peak. Uh, probably our highest year, we were about 2,800 cases. And a lot of years, we were just a little over 2,000 cases a year. 
And as time went on, so I, had, I started out with a distributor and then got a Washington distributor and then started approaching other people, other states about distributing my wine. And especially I would say in the early 2000s, even all through the, what do you call them, the zero zeros, uh, a lot of different states were looking to sell Oregon wine. Oregon wine is very popular. And it's probably still that way today. It's much harder to get a distributor these days. But um, back then, it was pretty much a phone call. It wasn't always a slam dunk. But oh, Oregon wine, sure, we'll try it. They tasted it. And um, that's how we picked up our distributors. And, and, and I got to a certain level on that, too. And it was just like, OK. This is about between juggling vineyard management and doing the winemaking and the sales part of it and all the uh, regulations that go with that. Uh, we were at a very comfortable level. And we stayed at that level for quite a few years. Why the name Terrapin? Uh, we wanted something fun. And uh, I had a label designer. And he put a, a terrapin as a, a freshwater turtle, mainly on the East Coast, and mainly, well, I'm not going to say Maryland, but that's one of the states we sell our wine in, the Maryland terrapins. But uh, it, we wanted something fun, and it was uh, the design for the terrapin, the turtle came up, but it fit the label well. And um, that's, yeah. It wasn't any like fixated thing. It was a combination of, of factors, and um, it was unique. There was a, uh, there's no other. In fact, I tried to get a uh, to trademark the name because I didn't want anybody else coming in. I learned through the trademark. There's a lot of things named terrapin, and one of them is actually a beer, in uh, somewhere down in Georgia. And uh, the guy, the trade uh, the trademark office said, well. You, the good news is, the bad news is, you can't get a trademark in this, but the good news is, this other company's been doing it, and beer and wine are, by the, the trademark are considered about the same. So I wasn't able to trademark my name, but he said, you don't have to worry about somebody coming in on top of you. And it's, it's been a catchy name, and, and people, a lot of people look out and go, oh, it's the turtle wine. So, you know, maybe it's part of that critter thing, I'm not sure. <laughs> So as, your, as uh, the wine brand grew and as you started making more wine, tell me about sort of stylistic choices and, and winemaking philosophy. What kind of, what was the, the goal for the finished product? Uh, to be as um, true to the grapes as possible, if that makes sense. You know, H, they talk, people talk a lot about terroir and it is definitely a, um, an important factor. You want the wine to taste like it comes from the area you're growing it in. And for example, for when I picked Pinot Gris, it was like, it's the white wine in Oregon. If you're going to be in Oregon, I think you should be making a Pinot Gris. I mean, a lot of people might say, well, you know, Chardonnay also. Um, at that time, Chard Oregon Chardonnay, it was there, but it wasn't as popular as Pinot Gris. And, um, I, just, I ended up liking Pinot Gris a lot. Um, it made sense to do a cool climate grape or in a cool climate area. Um, and then, of course, Pinot Noir. That came a year later. The first year was, uh, it was the, the Pinot Gris, and then the second year we had Pinot Noir, because if you're going to be in the Willamette Valley, you better be making a, a Pinot Noir. And there's a lot of other wines you can make. There's a lot of other grapes that grow really well here, but it's Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Pinot Noir is, is in Oregon has only gotten better and better, and we've really become an established player on the world scene. What, what were the biggest surprises for you about winemaking? Or what were the things that you hadn't learned in school and had to kind of learn on the job? Uh, probably the sales part of it, but also, you know, how you treat the grapes, the what style do you do? Do you want to have a, a wine that's, um, has a little bit of sugar in it or not? Or do you want to age it in wood? Um, I'm thinking the Pinot Gris in particular, and the, the Pinot Gris I liked, I found they'd been um, made and fermented in stainless steel. Um, we usually didn't let it go through uh, uh, malolactic fermentation. We want a wine that you could sit on a summer day and have a summer sipper, but also if you had a meal with it, it would go well with the meal. So a little bit of both. Um, keeping it simple, not getting, letting the, getting in the way of trying to manipulate the wine. Just let it go through its fermentation. Do the basic things like try not to let it go through malolactic fermentation. I just think it has a little more zip to it. Uh, try not to uh, get any wood, uh, like I say, oak barrels in, in the way to might influence a wine. I wanted a, 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 the purest expression of the grape I could get. And um, pretty much same thing for the Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir a little more complicated. 
Um, depends how you want to go, how you want to ferment it. Do you want to let it sit on the skins for a while? Do you want to delay the fermentation process? How much oak do you want to put it on? How much new oak do you want to put it on? And but once again, trying to let the fruit express itself and not me getting in the way of of, of adding other things that, that might influence the uh, the wine, and, and then paying attention to um, producers. There's so many great Pinot Noir producers in the valley, and we all have our favorites. And, and I'd find somebody I admire and try and find out what they did, how they treated their product, and, and that was a guide for me. But the biggest wine in wine, I think one of the biggest things is. If people buy your wine, then you know that somebody likes it. If people aren't buying your wine, then maybe you need to change something. Mm -hmm. And that was always what spurred me on, is making a product, a wine that people enjoyed and that people wanted to buy. So you mentioned your sell, kind of your selling strategy from the start was, was just distribution. Um, tell me about putting your wine in front of people, whether it's a consumer, whether it's a distributor, putting your wine out there and having it be, having it be judged. Uh, how, how did it feel when you, when you had a product to put in people's hands? Well, I, I, I'm not much of a natural salesman. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm sure I muddled it way, my way through it, but, um, you know, it's just, it's making the connection with a person. Um, that was the biggest thing. Sometimes you people you meet and you just feel you find something to talk about and then you start talking about what you do, you know, where the product came from, where the grapes came from, and then letting the wine speak for itself. And that was, those were the easy sales, uh, especially if you're, I really appreciate what uh, wine sales people um, who sell in the wholesale market because you, you go into busy restaurants, you're trying to get your product in front of a, uh, the buyer of the wine, whether it be the chef or the owner, and a lot of times they're, you know, they want something, they want you to get through it quick, they want something um, interesting, and of course in the bottom line is uh, the wine, do they like the wine, um, how much are you going to charge for it. Um, that was always a challenge for me, and that's why I never uh, got into that. You know, they talk about in, in the, the winemaking business, um, there's, there's three legs to it, and one is growing the grapes, which I enjoyed. That was my favorite part of the whole thing. Is I always enjoyed growing the grapes. There's just, um, that, that hit my sweet spot. Making wine was fun. Having something come out, how you envision you want it to come out. Um, that was very satisfying. And putting the whole package together, I remember choosing bottles and getting a label design, working with a label designer, coming up with a design that, you know, that they recommended that I was happy with, um, and then getting the wine in bottle and then getting it out on, onto the market. Um, that was good. So that's the second leg. So um, making the wine, growing the grapes, making the wine. And the third leg is the sales. And it, it may be the most important leg. I mean, obviously you have to have grapes. Yeah, you got to make the wine. But selling your wine, people, you can make the best wine in the world, but if you can't get it out to the market, then it stops there. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, was my, I just uh, was not naturally inclined to do that. I didn't have the desire. I didn't feel like that was my shtick. So I tried to avoid that. And that's why I got distributors. And, they made my life um, a lot easier. And it, it, you know, hopefully, I know it's worked out for them. It has to work out for both of us, right? So along the way, as you, as you grew, um, did you have, you had Pinot Noir, you had Pinot Gris, did you have aspirations beyond? Or did you kind of find your niche and, 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 and stay happy with it? Did you, did, you have, did you have the notion of trying other varietals or trying something different along the way? Or, or did you pretty much stick with what you liked from the start? Well, we've always had a Willamette Valley. Well, after the first, first year was just a Pinot Gris. And then we've always had a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir after that. And along the way, um, I'd always been um, uh, interested in port. I like to drink port well before I got into the wine industry. And um, I met somebody who made some port and uh, started talking to him about it. So I, I bought some Tempranillo grapes. It's one of the main grapes they use in Portugal. And I wanted to model myself after Portuguese ports. And so, um, yeah, I studied that, um, figured out where I needed to be, uh, the process of going to make it. And we made a port in 2004 from some Tempranillo grapes. And that was really fun and, and people liked it. So I made port for many years. Um, I stopped making port in 2016. Um, but that was, that was a great project. It was fun. Um, 
the, the, the more difficult thing is not a lot of people drink port, um, not near as many people as drink white wine, red wine. So the sales were always, I, you know, they, they, were, they were good, um, but it was definitely a, a special market and we didn't overproduce, so that made it easier too. Um, kind of lost some of the desire to make port, so at some point I took those grapes, it was after the 2016 season actually, um, and I decided to use those Tempranillo grapes and make a rosé of Tempranillo. So our first vintage of the uh, Tempranillo rosé was 2018, and I'm still making it today. It's just a fun wine to make, and it's a wine that when the sun comes out and it's warm, people like it, people buy it. It's, it's a very friendly wine. It's a fun wine to make. It's, the whole process is fun, getting the color just right, getting the flavors just right. So that was one of the, ones we, one of the uh, other wines we picked up. Um, I did make a, a rosé of Pinot Noir for a while. Um, it, it, and we did that for about three years, but so many people make, of course, we grow so much Pinot Noir here. They make uh, a rosé of Pinot Noir, and I didn't want to compete with that, and that's why I went to the uh, Tempranillo rosé. Um, one year we got some, uh, quote, free grapes, uh, some Sauvignon Blanc, so we did some Sauvignon Blanc. And I, that's something I wish I probably would have continued. It was fun. That was back in 2005 or six. So that was a fun one-year project. Um, at some point, I, I was getting asked, um, well, what's the next level of your Pinot Noir? And so I decided to start making a reserve. So in 2012, we did our first reserve. And we were managing some very nice vineyards up in the Eola Amity Hills. And so I started purchasing fruit from them to make uh, my reserve Pinot Noir. And I've been doing that since 2012. And that's been a really fun project. And that's a little more... Um, you need to fine tune things. So there's one thing about making a Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, it, it covers a pretty wide range, and especially our price point. Um, we got a lot of glass pours in our regular Pinot Noir. Uh, a lot of it's because of price point, and it, it, it reflected um, good uh, value, uh, Willamette Valley, Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, the uh, reserve was definitely a step up. Um, we needed to raise better grapes, um, needed to use a little bit more new oak, be a little bit pickier about the uh, the fruit we were growing and then and, and the winemaking process. Did you feel confident in being able to do that? Um, I've been around enough people and I asked enough questions. I did some great um, um, uh, internships early on when I was going to school in wineries and learned from some good winemakers about what they had done. So. Uh, and there's a lot of, re there's just a, a ton of resources. Uh, you know, being in the industry for a while and meeting winemakers, um, it's fun. They're, most of the people are very collaborative, very uh, willing you know, to tell me about their experiences, um, sometimes making recommendations. And so that always gave me a lot of confidence as I had people to rely on. If I ran into an issue or had a question like, how would you do this? Or what, what's your, been your experience? Um, there's never been a lack of people to, uh, to ask questions about, too. So that, that yeah, I, I'm not, I didn't fly into this whole thing. You know, even from the first winemaking experience, I had somebody kind of lead me by the hand, and they were great about explaining the whole process, and that gave me a lot of confidence, too. So f tell me about some of the sort of the milestones or highlights along the way, both on the, the, the vineyard management grape growing side, on the winery side, were there moments along the way that you look back on sort of most fondly or that you kind of feel like marked a, a, a point of progress for you? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking like the first one was um, probably when we went from about 45 acres and we took on a 30 acre vineyard. So that almost doubled our size. And there was something about that jump that uh, I realized that, okay, we don't even have to stop at 75. So let's start taking on more clients. And it was that one offer we had to manage the 30 acres. It worked out really well the first year. And um, so, like I say, that was like, okay, then we can just keep going. And had, had, had plenty of people to hire. And, and that's what's nice about, um, I had a, a great foreman. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but he ended up purchasing the company from me, and he's still doing it today. And um, 
working side by side with him, I knew he was going to stick around and, and I gave him opportunities to make sure he would stick around. We leased vineyards that he was responsible for, that he could um, um, make the money from the vineyard, make any profit that we made off the vineyard. And that got him really involved. So he was watching my back with my projects and I was helping him with his projects, um, doing all the, all the paperwork and, and doing all the um, uh, regulatory stuff that we needed to do, contracts with the growers. And um, it was a great collaboration that was, and that all happened probably shortly after we expanded our, our, our vineyard management company from 45 acres. And like three years later, we were doing about 150 acres. Mm -hmm. And um, that, was, that was very satisfying. And then having people come back year after year, that was always, a, a, um, I don't know, I must be doing something right kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people move on because uh, they have other opportunities, but there was a core group that came back year after year, and I tried to treat them as well. I did treat them as well as I could. I was able to, and mainly through um, you know the way I treated them, uh, their pay they got, some benefits they got. Um, you treat people well, and they're going to treat you well. What about for the Terrapin seller side? Are there moments along the way, kind of similar question, that kind of felt like you had arrived at a place or that you were pro progressing the way you wanted to progress? Um, yeah, I would say mainly through uh, sales. Uh, every time we picked up a distributor, it was kind of like a feather in the cap. It's like, okay, we can increase production now. Um, th those were it. And then, uh, you know, getting, getting reviews in wine magazines, um, that was fun. Getting a score in the Wine Spectator was definitely a highlight. And then some other wine, uh, wine magazines over the years. Um, kind of stopped chasing scores a little, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but at the time, it was definitely, it's like, okay, if the critics are liking this, then, then I, you know, I, I feel like um, it, it's one thing to have a customer buy it, probably the most important, because they're your support. But when you have a, a wine critic who, who tastes hundreds or thousands of wines a year, to have them say they like your wine and you give it a, a score that you can be proud of, um, that's definitely a confidence booster and it, it spurs you on to, to want to keep doing it. So you mentioned kind of from the start, liking the people, liking the industry, finding mentors, finding things like that. Tell me about how you've seen the industry sort of evolve in the time you've, you've been part of it. Um, what are the, the changes you've seen along the way and what does the industry kind of look like now versus when you first were familiar with it? Uh, well, for one thing, it's, it's obvious, it's just gotten huge, so much bigger than it was. I remember being able to go into stores in the early, you know, I'll say 2003 or four, and know most of the labels that were on the shelf in a wine shop or in a grocery store, their wine section. And, um, you know, it seemed like 10 years later that it's like I walk in and I don't know half of them. Um, is it just expanded dramatically, and it, it, which is good. So it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? It's just like, okay, there's... A lot of people getting into it. That's really fun. It really shows that uh, we're in a good place to grow grapes and, and people want to buy wine, Oregon wine. So that part of it's good. It's gotten so much more competitive. It's um, definitely harder to sell wine these days than it was, yeah, I would say even 10 years ago. So that's and so that that's a, you know the, the success has has is, is made us very well known. Um, more people want to drink Oregon wine, but then also people want to make more Oregon wine. And there's so many more vineyards than uh, when we started out. You mentioned the, the competition uh, on the vineyard management side. Did you see something similar? Were you finding more competitors to manage the vineyards as they were growing, or was there still a pretty high demand for that work? I'd say there was still a high demand. I pretty much got asked every year if I was interested in managing another vineyard. So I think there, I'm not saying there's a lack of people, but there are, um, the demand is out there. And it's, it's like anything, there's uh, some, um, there's that synergy between owner and vineyard management company. I know some people weren't happy with other people, and so that's why we'd get recommendations and people would want to talk. Um, so yeah, there was, there's either people changing their mind, new vineyard expansion. Um, it's really demanding work and it's, uh, it probably frustrates a lot of people. So I think um, that's, it's not the glamorous part <laughs> of the wine industry. 
Um, so I think that's why there's always demand. I'm sure, you know, I could have, I know in fact, I could have tripled the size of the company if I wanted to, if I wanted to take on that. Whereas the wine industry is just like, there's X amount of people buying wine and there's just, the, there's so much more. So you depend on constant growth for selling wine. And if less people are drinking wine, then there's a squeeze on going on somewhere. Um, shelf space is really difficult. You can only hold in wine shops or wine sections so many bottles. So is yours going to be one of those bottles? Um, same with restaurants. I really enjoyed one of the more really satisfying things about uh, wine sales is um, is to see your wine in a restaurant in the glass pour. That just it's just fun. It's fun to go into a restaurant. I don't know where a lot of my product goes. I you know I could ask my distributor, but they have their own salespeople selling it. And sometimes I'd show up to a place and it's like, oh wow, they're selling terrapin cellars, and that was a really satisfying, you know, especially the first few times it happened. It's more common now, but that's always very gratifying. So what do you see coming next for the Oregon wine industry, both on the vineyard management, viticulture side, the wine side, the sales side? What's been sort of the next step for the Oregon wine industry? Well, it's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I would think so if the vineyard management side might be a little bit easier, I would think that we're going to have to probably mechanize a little bit. Um, vineyard labor has gotten so expensive. I kind of wonder um, what these vineyard, what vineyard donors, since I'm a little out of that loop now since 2020, I know that the rise is just from talking to my um, uh, foreman, the guy I sold the company to, is how much he's had to raise the rate. So I'm wondering, what are people having to pay? In fact, I do know because I still buy Pinot Noir grapes. The price for grapes has increased dramatically. And so how are we going to be able to compete on, for the, on the shelf for wines from other regions. I mean, yeah, we can get Oregon wines really expensive, but if people slow down or stop buying them altogether, that's going to become an issue. So how do we address the labor issue? Well, maybe we do more mechanized. We try and put a lid on how much it's going to cost to grow those grapes so that we can stay competitive when our wines hit the shelves. Um, I was saying for the wine industry, we're just going to have to keep touting that Oregon wine story. Why Oregon is such a unique place? Why we make good wines? And um, yeah, just p putting that out there, making making the world know um, that we are unique, why we're unique, and why we can produce such such great wines. Obviously, that's that's something that you've seen, as you mentioned. Like Oregon had a demand, even from when you started. Oregon was in demand. Um, has that gotten easier to tell to tell the Oregon story? Are more people aware of it now? Is or is it still an uphill battle to let people know about Oregon and the quality here? You know, I'm not versed enough to know if, if enough people know about it, but um, a lot of people do. A lot more people know about it. Oregon is looked at as a Pinot Noir, you know, one of the best growing places in the world for Pinot Noir. To, it can rival any, anywhere. So a lot of people do know that. I think there is probably a little bit of education going on for the casual wine drinker, the people who are in the wine world, who, you know, serious wine drinkers. They know that Oregon's here. Um, but yeah, I think we need to keep telling that story. So tell us about the, the, kind, of, the kind of future for yourself then. What are you looking ahead to uh, wine-wise or otherwise um, in, in the future for yourself? Uh, well, one of the fun things I've, uh, I've done since um, I got out of the vineyard management, I, I have a lot more time. I'm pretty much involved um, during harvest because bringing the grapes in, making the wine, there comes the bottling part, and then I'm always trying to stay uh, in contact with my distributors, see how they're doing what they see on the market. How can I help them? I mean, they're my customers. Obviously, they're not the end customer, but it's my, I got to keep my distributors happy, um, keep them satisfied that I'm putting out a product they can sell, trying to make their job easy. Um, so I, that's what I, I'm, I'm maintaining that now. Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe even coming up with a new product. I'm thinking about doing maybe, perhaps maybe a sparkling wine. This seems to be such a hot thing now. And it, it, it'd be kind of fun. I, I wouldn't mind taking on a new project like that, having a new product on the line. I'm also at the part in my career where I'm leveling out. In fact, even probably drawing back a little bit on the wine side. Um, some just because I'm at that point in my life where I, I 
want to let up on the gas pedal a little bit more than I already have. Um, but um, I still like, I like going out wine tasting. There's a couple great Oregon wine producers. I love drinking their wine, so I, I have more time to kind of look at that and um, enjoy that, going to uh, fun events, not uh, work events. <laughs> But I'll, you know, I, I love the Oregon wine industry, and I'll always be involved. I'm still involved with the grape growers group um, that we go to have monthly meetings, and it's fun for the social aspect. And I kind of get to keep in touch with what's going on in the vineyards, um, and, and maybe even wine sales too. But more, this this is a growers group, so it's it's kind of fun to see what you know. Some of them are my ex clients, um, and just see see how their vineyards are going, see how they're doing, see what's what's happening with them. So, I, I do like staying with that. I I can't ever see myself completely withdrawing from it. Maybe work wise, I'll we'll stop making wine at some point. But um, for now, it's I, I want to stay involved. I want to stay connected. And, um, you know, we've lived in Salem for about 30 years now, and um, I'll continue to live here because it's in the middle of wine country. Do you have a hope for what happens with Terrapin Cellars long term? No, I, to be honest with you, I don't have a plan. You know, the vineyard management part was easy. We had a, a, a client list, and um, this guy had been with me, Juan had been with me for these 20 years. And um, so that was pretty easy. I wanted to make sure my clients had somebody, they treated me well over the years. They had somebody to continue. I wasn't going to just drop them. Uh, Terrapin Cellars is a little bit different. There's a lot of wines out there, a lot of wine labels. So I think when I stop making Terrapin Cellars, then that might be the end of Terrapin Cellars. But I'm not positive, but I, I don't have a, a clear path forward on that. If I owned a winery, I'd, I'd have a different view on it, like I had assets to sell, and um, yeah, we have, we have distributors that sell our wines, but um, a lot of people have distributors, so it, it's a tough one, it's, it's, it's kind of hard, and that's what, you know, one of the things that I won't say spurs me on, but keeps me interested is, is I, I've been doing this now, um, see we're making our 23rd vintage right now, and uh, it's been fun, I don't want to see an end anytime soon. So if someone were to ask you for your advice or words of wisdom on getting into the Oregon wine industry today, what would you tell them? Well, just from speaking my experience, um, definitely get an education. Um, the Chemeketa program is great. It's, this might be a plug for Chemeketa, but it really, it, it changed my life. Um, I went ahead and got the, I told you, the viticulture degree. I did take a few winemaking classes along the way, got winemaking experience by doing internships. Um, so that's... You, you come out of there with knowing something, and you make a lot of connections. I made a lot of connections just going to school. Um, if you're a younger person and you really want to be even more serious about it, um, you know, go to one of the four-year programs. There's, there's a lot of, you know, maybe Oregon State has one. I'm not sure about that, but of course UC Davis, Washington State, there's others. Um, get an education, totally immerse yourself in it. That's a good way to get on. For me, going to Chemeca to work great, I was already mid-life. I wasn't going to um, take four years out and go to university, and Chemeca to worked out great for that. It, it, as in, is in town, right where I lived, and um, uh, it was a really good stepping off point. Got a really, a lot of practical experience. All right. All the questions that I have for you, uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, or anything we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I'm sure I'll think of something later, but... <laughs> Everybody always does. Yeah, yeah. No, not really. I, one of the things I really like about both the vineyard side and the winemaking side is the vintage variation. Every year is different. You don't do things the same way. Yeah, there's the basic things you do, but everything, depending on what the vintage throws at you, plant-wise, how you treat the plants, um, in the winery, you know, what, you know, was it a really hot year, was it a cool year? Um, I really like that. It makes every year exciting. Nothing is the same. It's never boring. You've got to figure it out. And I, I love that challenge. It's a very common theme in our interviews. People like having the difference year to year, day to day, month to month along the way. So I, I totally hear that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, sharing your story with us, and, and visiting us on this great December day. Uh, go ahead and let you off the hook. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.